uh, dear colleagues, it is a pleasure to be here and to present something about uh, hypertensive emergencies. What I uh, will discuss with you uh, this afternoon is uh, the definition and uh, classification of hypertensive emergencies, then uh, something about treatment principles, uh, the different uh, agents we have to treat this uh, condition, and then I will go a little bit further in uh, selected emergencies, and then I will uh, complete with take-home messages. Hypertensive emergencies together with uh, urgencies uh, are what we call hypertensive crisis, and from a clinical perspective it is uh, uh, very useful to distinguish between emergencies and uh, urgencies because uh, the, the treatment approach is different. I also have to say there is some overlap between emergencies and urgencies and uh, even though it's, uh, even though it's uh, urgencies and very severe hypertension. The definition of a hypertensive uh, emergency is a situation that requires immediate reduction in blood pressure because of acute or progressing target organ damage. The incidence is of about uh, 1 to 2 per 100,000 persons and it is uh, much more frequent in blacks than in whites. A useful uh, classification of hypertensive emergencies uh, is uh, uh, considering the target organ that is uh, much damaged, but sometimes uh, two or more organs can be uh, damaged. And then if you go to the brain, uh, most familiar to hypertensiologists is of course the hypertensive encephalopathy, but also a cerebral infarction, intracerebral hemorrhage, or a subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, can be hypertensive emergencies. If you go further to the eyes, uh, advanced retinopathy, to the heart we have the acute coronary syndromes and uh, of course acute congestive heart failure. Uh, considering the aorta, the acute dissection of the aorta and then if you go to the kidney, acute renal failure. And then if you go to the placenta and metanol circulation, we uh, have an emergency in uh, patients with uh, women with uh, severe uh, preeclampsia and of course in women with eclampsia. The treatment uh, principles I will uh, discuss now. Um, yeah, we uh, have to treat uh, emergencies uh, with uh, rapidly acting parenteral uh, agents usually and uh, we have to know that uh, target blood, sp blood pressure depends uh, uh, on the underlying condition and the same is uh, true for the speed at which the target blood pressure should be reached. Important is that when reducing blood pressure that we maintain the cerebral, cardiac and renal perfusion and uh, we should be aware of uh, overtreatment. I will come to this within a minute. And usually uh, no diuretics in lens uh, patients are uh, overloaded, for instance in patients with uh, renal failure and patients with congestive heart failure. This is a graphic scheme of uh, under or over treatment of a hypertensive emergency. When we start treatment, we must define our uh, upper and lower limit we want to reach within a certain time. And especially over treatment is a uh, thing what happens rather frequently when we uh, are treating patients with hypertensive emergencies. This is uh, shown on this slide, it was a retrospective study of uh, about blood pressure control in malignant hypertension uh, treated by IV infusion with antihypertensive agents 
And uh, appropriate blood pressure reduction was a 25% reduction of mean arterial pressure within the first two hours and a blood pressure uh, goal of 160 over 100 at six hours. And as you uh, see the, the figures, that uh, the proportion of patients with appropriate blood pressure reduction at two hours was 32 in this uh, study, and the proportion of patients with excessive blood pressure reduction at two hours was uh, 57. There were uh, treatment failures at two hours, about 11 uh, percent. And if you look at six hours, uh, the, the proportion of patients with appropriate blood pressure reduction at six hours was 30 percent. And if you look to the proportion of patients meeting the two hour and six hour blood pressure goals, that was 28 percent. So there is uh, room for improvement for the treatment of hypertensive emergencies. The different uh, agents we have, uh, I will now discuss very shortly. Uh, we can uh, divide our parenteral uh, agents in uh, vasodilators and adrenergic receptor blockers. The vasodilators, uh, the most known is, uh, I think, sodium nitroprusside but also uh, nitroglycerin. We have the calcium channel blockers, nicaripine and clavidipine. Then we have a uh, dopamine agonist, phenoldopan. Then the ketensurin, which is a 5-HE2 antagonist and an alpha receptor blocker. And then we have uh, hydrolysin, of which the mechanism is not known. If you look to the uh, adrenergic receptor blockers, then we have the perif peripheral blocker uh, labetalol, which is a non-selective beta blocker and an alpha receptor blocker. We have uh, esmolol, which is a cardioselective uh, beta blocker, and uh, phentolamin, a non-selective alpha blocker, which is usually restricted for the treatment of patients with uh, pheochromocytoma. And then we have uh, the combination of a peripheral and a central uh, adrenergic receptor blocker that is Urepidil, and that is an alpha-1 receptor blocker and a central 5-ET2-1A uh, agonist. Then something about sodium nitroprusside that is, uh, you can yeah, say, the, the classic vasodilator used for uh, IV use. If you look to the hemodynamics of this agent, it is an arterial and venous uh, dilator. It uh, lowers afterload and uh, preload, and it is associated with an increase in heart rate and stroke volume. There are some advantages. It uh, works very rapidly and also very short, and it is an extremely potent agent. But there are also some disadvantages with this agent. It can uh, induce a coronary steel syndrome in patients uh, that can be dangerous in patients with coronary artery disease. It can increase the intracranial pressure and reduce cerebral blood flow. And it can also uh, induce uh, cyanide uh, toxicity because 44% uh, of the weight of uh, Sodium nitroprusside is a cyanide, and that is metabolized in the liver by uh, thiosulfate in uh, nitroprusside uh, thiocyte. The dosage of uh, nitroprusside, this, uh, you can only use it when you also have the possibility for continuous blood pressure monitor, and the starting dose is usually 0.25 microgram per kilogram IVs, and the uh, maximum dose is 10, uh, 10 microgram per kilogram for a maximum of 10 minutes. There are some problems with sodium nitroprusside, and this is a study from uh, Amsterdam. And they have looked to the effects of uh, sodium nitroprusside. Here on the left side, and here uh, compared that with uh, labetalol on uh, systemic 
and cerebral vascular resistance. And if you can, you can see that if you infuse sodium nitroprusside, there's more decrease in systemic vascular resistance than in cerebral vascular resistance. And if you compare that with labetadol, the decrease in systemic and cerebral vascular resistance is the same. Then if you look to this uh, slide, the reduction uh, in MOP and the decrease in middle cerebral artery blood velocity uh, as a function of blood pressure reduction, you see that with the same decrease in blood pressure, there is more decrease in cerebral uh, blood flow with sodium nitroprusside than with labetalol. So this was uh, a conclusion from uh, Varen in uh, drugs already in 2008. Uh, sodium nitroprusside only be used when other IV antihypertensive agents are not available. Labetalol, uh, or also known as Trandate or Normodine, is a non-selective uh, beta uh, adrenergic receptor blocker and a selective alpha-1 adrenergic receptor blocker in a ratio of about 5 to 1. It induces vasodilatation without uh, reflex tachycardia. It has uh, a lot of advantages, as you can see on the slide. There are some uh, side effects. And you can give it as repeated uh, dosages of 20 to 80 milligram or an infusion with an infusion rate of about 2 to 20 uh, milligram per hour IV. Uh, onset of action is about in 5 to 10 minutes and duration of action is about 3 to 6 hours. And there are contraindications as I will show on the next slides. The contraindications are uh, concurrent beta blocker treatment, bradycardia, sick sinus syndrome and decompensated cardiac failure. Esmolol is an interesting uh, beta blocker because it has a very rapid onset of action and also a short duration uh, of action because it is uh, inactivated by uh, metabolism by uh, erythrocyte esterases. This means that in case of anemia, the duration of action of this agent is increased. Then uh, some selected emergencies. First, hypertensive encephalopathy, that uh, about 60% of the hypertensive emergencies are hypertensive encephalopathies. Uh, usually in patients with a relatively short uh, history of hypertension, and the pathophysiology is that in this situation, blood pressure exceeds the upper limit of cerebral autoregulation, so you get a breakthrough vasodilatation this uh, capillary hypertension, brain hyperperfusion, and ardein formation. The limit of autoregulation, this at what level uh, there is a breakthrough phase dilatation, depends on pre-existing blood pressure. This is higher for patients with pre-existent hypertension. And interestingly, the uh, preferred localization is in the parieto-occipital region, in the uh, current of the basal artery. The symptoms of uh, hypertensive encephalopathy are headache, confusion, somnolence, stupor, loss of vision, seizures, and uh, when it is becoming more severe, coma. You can uh, diagnose uh, the presence of hypertensive encephalopathy uh, best on an MRI scan, and then you see hyperintensity uh, in the basal and parietal regions. The treatment of hypertensive encephalopathy is uh, now the patient has to admit it to the intensive care unit. Uh, he should have an arterial line and the initial blood pressure reduction should be about 25% and a ta or a target diastolic blood pressure of about 110 millimeters of mercury. And first choice agents are uh, labetalol, as shown here, or nicardipine, a calcium channel blocker. Acute intracerebral hemorrhage is about 10 to 50 percent of uh, strokes in high uh, income Western countries are uh, hemorrhages, but that is much higher in uh, low to middle income developing countries. And uh, 
Many patients with a cerebral hemorrhage have a very high blood pressure, and the high blood pressure is associated with a poor outcome. Uh, there is perhaps some relation with, the, uh, uh, with the, the blood pressure with the growth of the hematoma, and uh, yeah, we, we don't know for short whether intensive blood pressure lowering is uh, beneficial or deleterious. If you look to the guidance uh, on the management of elevated blood pressure uh, following an intracerebral hemorrhage, then the idea is when blood pressure is systolic blood pressure higher than 200 or mean arterial pressure higher than 150, uh, consider blood pressure lowering by uh, infusion of short-acting agents, um, especially labetalol and nicarapine. If uh, blood pressure is 180 or mean arterial pressure uh, higher than 130, uh, with the possibility of a raised intracranial pressure, uh, then consider monitoring intracranial pressure and uh, reducing blood pressure with uh, IV infusion, but uh, you have to maintain the uh, transcranial pressure about 60 millimeters of mercury. If uh, blood pressure is uh, higher than 180 and mean arterial pressure higher than 130, with no evidence of raised uh, intracranial pressure, you can consider modest reduction of blood pressure with IV infusion. There is, I think two years ago also on this uh, Congress, uh, uh, the presentation of the INTERACT-2 trial, and there's an interesting trial, is uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, then they have compared patients with uh, intracerebral hemorrhage and hypertension, intensive blood pressure lowering with a systolic blood pressure uh, target below 140 compared to uh, a less intensive blood pressure reduction. And as you can see, the primary outcome of death or major disability was uh, not significant difference, but there was some improvement in the ranking scale and the conclusion of this uh, trial is in patients with uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, intensive reduction of blood pressure did not result in a significant reduction in the primary outcome, death or major disability, but moderately improved modified ranking scale. Thus apparently we should not be afraid that reduction of blood pressure is very dangerous in selected patients with intracerebral hemorrhage. Then acute ischemic stroke, uh, there is a U-shaped uh, relation between uh, admission blood pressure and outcome. Uh, blood pressure in most patients uh, declines spontaneously in the first uh, 24 hours. And there have been a lot of trials with antihypertensive uh, treatment. And uh, the results of these trials that treatment is not beneficial and sometimes even deleterious. Treatment indications if blood pressure is very high, as shown here, and then you will go for about 50% blood pressure reduction. The, it can be that there are also other conditions that require blood pressure reduction. Think, uh, think about an acute coronary syndrome. And uh, also if acute reperfusion is, uh, thrombolysis is required, uh, then the blood pressure should be lowered to the levels as shown there. And also here, uh, preferred medication is uh, labetalol or otherwise nicarapine. And the target blood pressure should be about on 180 over 105. Aortic dissection that uh, is shown here on this uh, CT scan, that is uh, associated with acute, severe, sharp, or tearing uh, posterior or back pain. Uh, also, other organs can be involved due to uh, artery occlusion, and uh, the risk factors are shown here. Now, if you look to the uh, medical management of uh, aortic dissection, then we have the, uh, our guidelines, I have to say, and then uh, yeah, start with pain relief, with uh, morphine, and then uh, blood pressure reduction with a target systolic blood pressure between 100 to 120 millimeters of mercury. And uh, the first shows are beta blockers, IV, to decrease uh, the DPDT, which is the force of left ventricular contraction. 
and then you can use, usually in our hospital we use uh, labetalol, but there are also other uh, uh, medications you can use, and for instance esmolol and sodium nitroposide are also agents that are frequently used in this condition. Then if you look to the American Heart Association's guideline, uh, this, the same blood pressure target, but they emphasize uh, the need for a reduction in heart rate lower than 60s uh, beats per minute. And here those first shows are beta blockers. Then hypertension in uh, pregnancy, and yeah, when it is an emergency, they say if blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is uh, above 170, and diastolic blood pressure is above 110 millimeters of mercury, uh, these patients the, uh, require hospitalization. You can uh, start, for instance, with intravenous uh, labetalol, but uh, there's also the possibility to treat these patients uh, first with oral uh, antihypertensive tr treatment and then uh, methyl dopa or uh, nifedipine. Uh, Hydrohalazine was a uh, drug that was used very frequently for this condition that is uh, no longer a drug of first choice. And nicaripine can be a good alternative for labetalol. And of course, if there is a pulmonary iodine, uh, nitroglycerin can be used. The target blood pressure in this condition is 130 over 90. And I think uh, very important, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on that, that we should also treat these patients with severe uh, preeclampsia, with uh, magnesium sulfate, high venously, with a loading dose of about 4 grams in 5 minutes, and then an infusion for 1 gram per hour. That should be continued for uh, 24 hours uh, postpartum to prevent seizures, and that should be given in every patient with severe preeclampsia. So then I come to my take-home messages. Uh, hypertensive dementia are uh, yeah, a constitutive collection of uh, hydrogenous conditions. The speed and initial, initial degree of blood pressure lowering uh, is de dependent on the type of emergency. And if we look to uh, daily practice, uh, the guideline proposed blood pressure targets and the timelines are achieved in less than one third of patients, uh, especially the danger of uh, overtreatment. Sodium nitroprusside has disadvantages compared to other vasodilating agents and is, uh, I think, no longer a first choice agent. Labetatol is still uh, fashionable for the treatment of many different hypertensive emergencies. And this was uh, a quote of Chani et al. We feel it important for physicians to know that is one of the clinical settings where treatment is not supported by randomized control trial evidence. Thank you.